Welcome to my pregnancy diaries. As I record this, it is Monday, January 15th, and I just found out last week that I was pregnant. And according to my Natural Cycles app, I'm four weeks and three days pregnant, which means that just three days ago was when I missed my period. I decided that it could be really cool if I just popped on the mic every single week throughout this pregnancy, if not every week, maybe every other week, and just recorded how I'm feeling, what's happening in my body, the changes that are going on, what's happening in my life. And then at the end of the pregnancy, I can string them all together into three separate parts. So first trimester, second and third, and have these little diaries to look back on. I look back at some of the notes in my notes app that I wrote down during my pregnancy with Milo. And I love looking at those. It's a really great way to reflect on what I experienced. And especially now being in my second pregnancy, I'm consulting those notes a lot to try to remind myself what I can expect. And so I feel like this video slash audio diary is going to be useful not only for me if I ever go through a third pregnancy, but for a lot of people out there just to hear a week by week take on what's going on. I am feeling a little bit breathless. I don't know if it's the early pregnancy, but I feel like I'm out of breath. So if I'm huffing and puffing in your ears, Apologies in advance. My natural cycles tells me I have 249 days to go, and that's a little bit daunting, but let me just get into kind of how I'm feeling in these early days. So if I go back to before Michael and I even tried this month, I just wanna talk a little bit about the experience of getting ready to try for your second after you already have a first. It took us a really, really long time to be ready. And I have a ton of friends who had babies around the same time as me the first time. Many of them had babies after me the first time and they got pregnant or had their second kid way before us. Surprisingly, and I say surprisingly because it surprised us, we were just not ready when we thought we would be ready. The way we had sort of timed it in our head was that before Milo turned two, we thought we would start trying for a second. And when that time came around, we were just, we looked at each other And we both just knew, we had this knowing feeling of this doesn't feel right. It just, we're not ready. We're not excited about this the way we were the first time around. And maybe that's because we knew too much. (laughs) Like we knew what was coming up, that it didn't just feel like this magical, mystical, loving experience of procreating and raising a child, but we knew how much physical and emotional work was gonna go into that. So it took us a really long time to come to terms with the fact that we were about to embark on that journey again. So I think it was around October because Milo is a November baby. So when it was October, just before he turned two, Michael and I spoke about it and we said, I think let's wait just one more month. Let's give ourselves one more month. November started to roll around. And if you remember, December of 2023 is when I officiated my sister's wedding. So in November, I had this deep fear that if I try in November and if I get pregnant right away, then I might be really sick and unwell at my sister's wedding in December. And I'm not just the maid of honor or a guest at this wedding. I am standing up there running the damn thing. So I can't be morning sicknessing around this wedding. So that kind of caused us to say, okay, clearly we're just, I'm coming up with excuses here because we're not ready for this yet. So we decided let's just wait until the end of the year. I knew I'd be ovulating around the end of December and it felt more fitting for us to go into the new year in our trying time rather than trying to wrap it up at the end of this year just for the sake of doing it. So we really waited until my last ovulation of the year, which happened around our vacation time when we were away for New Year's. Similar to my experience with Milo, This was my first time trying. I had just switched my Natural Cycles app from prevent a pregnancy to plan a pregnancy. I knew I was ovulating. I was looking at my app to see which days we should try. And we tried on the two days, you know, the day before ovulation and the day of ovulation when my app said peak fertility. And then we went into the new year. Here's what happens. Most people have about a two week luteal phase. I actually know from my natural cycles that my luteal phase, which is the phase after ovulation, is more like 10 days plus or minus one, which is technically a short luteal phase, but it's what my body has always done. I remembered that was my luteal phase before my first pregnancy as well. So around five or six days post ovulation, my understanding is that that is when 
the fertilized embryo, if it does get fertilized, would implant itself in the uterus. And just around that time, similar to my first experience with Milo, I started feeling slight pinching sensations at different times of the day. Little twinges, I would call them. There were two other things that I felt that sort of tipped me off to the fact that I was pregnant. Number one, a little more enigmatic, but I swear it's real for me, is that I was feeling energy coursing through my uterus. And I don't mean spiritual energy, not like anything religious. I mean physical energy, almost like a buzzing sensation, as if my uterus was alive. I think scientifically, if I were to, I don't know, if I were to actually guess what I was feeling there, I think that it could have just been like blood rushing to this area. I think that that happens when you have a fertilized embryo that's implanting itself. Whatever it was, I was feeling a lot of motion and buzzing. And secondly, this is a little stranger, and I know this is not something that everyone experiences, but I have this small gland that is almost on the side of, I don't even know where I'd call it, on the side of my pelvis. During my pregnancy, the first time, I remember feeling this gland a lot. Like I would touch it and it almost felt like a little ball inside of my, inside of my pelvis. I don't know what it was. And I kept asking my OB, is this normal? What is this? And she would touch it and she would say, yeah, it's just a gland. You're fine. Then I gave birth and the gland went away and I never really felt it again. And then the week after trying this time around, I'm lying in bed and I touch that area of my body and there is the gland again. So I was pretty convinced this was the early stage of pregnancy. My body kind of was having those knowing sensations like I felt the first time around. Because as I said, my period is usually expected after 10 days. So because of that, I took my first pregnancy test eight days post ovulation. A lot of people would get a negative test at this point, especially if they have a a 14 day luteal phase. Eight days is just very early. I took the test and it was one of those clear blue tests. It said not pregnant. At this point, Michael and I kind of look at each other. I told him it's still very early. If this says not pregnant, it's not definite that I'm not pregnant. It's just very early. So we waited until the next day, day nine post ovulation, and we took another clear blue test and it, it said once again, not pregnant. Now at this point, My period was either coming the next day or the next day would be the first day of my missed period. And that would be the day that I would likely test positive. So going into that experience, I remember having my natural cycles app handy and ready. I was sleeping with my aura ring. And part of the reason that I was so invested in my natural cycles this coming up day was because I was getting ready to wake up and look at my temperature. If anyone out there tracks their temperature regularly, you will know that In a typical cycle, after you ovulate, your temperature spikes and it stays elevated throughout your luteal phase. If you are getting your period, usually that is the day when your temperature drops. So in every cycle, I wake up in the morning at some point and my temperature is back down a full degree and it looks like a big drop on my natural cycles. And that is the day that at some point in the day I get my period. However, when you're pregnant, your temperature does not ever drop and it stays elevated to help you sustain the pregnancy. So I went to sleep on the night of my day nine post ovulation, expecting to wake up in the morning and check, is my temperature still elevated? If so, I think I'm probably pregnant or is it gonna drop and am I gonna expect my period? However, we had the worst timing in the world and Michael and I had decided on my day nine post ovulation to go to the drugstore and get our COVID and our flu vaccines at the same time. If you've gotten these vaccines, you know it can cause a raging fever, which Michael and I both got. So all night, we're both in bed, shivering, huddling together. And the moment I wake up in the morning, I check my natural cycles. I'm so excited to see this temperature because I feel like it's gonna clue me in on something. And unfortunately, my natural cycles app says temperature omitted. It knew that I had a fever all night. It knew that my temperature was way too high from this fever. So it just struck it out. It didn't even tell me what it was. I went into that day sort of blind, not knowing, am I going to get my period or am I not? And this was the day Michael and I took a couple of tests. So we took another clear blue test that was the pregnant or not pregnant. And we also took one of the... CVS brand plus sign tests where if it's positive, you see a vertical line with the horizontal line. And if it's negative, you just see the horizontal line. This time that test, the 
The plus sign test had a very faint positive line. On first glance, it looked like absolutely nothing, like just a horizontal line. But when you really look at it, the positive vertical line was there very lightly. And I saw that and I thought that's a positive pregnancy test. And we paired it that day with another one of the digital tests to see if it said pregnant or not pregnant. And we unfortunately got a book error on the test. I think that when you pee on the stick and you don't lay it flat, perfectly flat, you can sometimes create an error in the test. So we had a book error. Michael's the kind of person, I don't know, he really wants to see pregnant. I thought looking at this plus sign test, that's a clear sign to me that I'm pregnant. But Michael said, let's try first P of the morning. The next day, we'll do one more digital test and see if we can see the word pregnant. So the next day, we repeat the plus sign test and the digital test. The plus sign test is still very faint, but the line is there, which to me was my second positive pregnancy test. And unfortunately, Michael and I reveal, you know, we had a tissue on top of the digital test to keep it hidden from us. And we did one, two, three and ripped it off. And it was another book error. Upon further inspection of the box, I think I was using expired tests, which is my bad. Long story short, I run out to CVS. I'm like, I can't wait another day. I actually had kept my first morning pee in a cup. So I said, I'm running out to CVS and doing this again with this P because listen, I just got two positives on these other tests. So I just need one digital test to tell me I'm pregnant to get Michael to not believe me, but I don't know. He just needed to know by seeing that word. So I run out to the drugstore. I buy the tests. I dip a first response test and a clear blue in at the same time, lay them perfectly flat. We wait five minutes. We reveal it. And there it is. Pregnant. And the other test we did was a yes or no. And so it said yes. Maybe it was because I had already known I was pregnant because I had gotten two positive tests beforehand with those plus sign tests. But for whatever the reason, I was I was really excited, but I was not completely baffled and completely overwhelmed. And my heart wasn't racing 10,000 miles an hour. And it just didn't feel as intense in any way as the first time around. And you know what? I was so happy about that. I was so happy about that because really, when I think back to my first pregnancy with Milo, I remember the experience of being pregnant and I remember all of a sudden the day I find out I'm pregnant, it was like my life flipped upside down in terms of the thoughts running through my brain, the things I'm talking about, the things I'm doing, the content I'm consuming, the content I'm creating. And if you followed me around that time, I mean, I didn't announce it until after the first trimester was up, but... If you followed me throughout the pregnancy after I announced it, you probably could tell that my content shifted a lot to what I was going through at the time. And when I look back at that experience, listen, I'm grateful I had that experience. I'm grateful I threw myself into learning and studying and reading books about having kids. And I'm grateful for everything that happened that first time around. But to do that again sounds incredibly exhausting, like something that I'm just not interested in this time around. I feel like for this second pregnancy, I feel like, listen, I've been there. I already dove into the learning phase and the garnering of information phase, and I went through a period in my life when the only thing on my mind was baby. And now I'm on the other side of motherhood where I have a toddler and I'm sort of back to myself in a lot of ways. So now that I'm getting pregnant again, it doesn't have to mean that I'm thrusting myself back into full-on pregnancy, baby, mindset, and headspace. I think I can go through this second pregnancy in a little bit of, I guess I'll use the word, a little bit of a chiller state. I'm doing me. I'm doing the things that I set out to do this year. I have a lot of goals for 2024. I'm starting this podcast. Actually, as I record this, I know you guys are going to hear this a little bit later once I put out the first trimester diary, but as I'm recording this, this is actually the first week that I'm doing podcast recording. So I haven't even recorded more than two episodes of the podcast at this point. And I am so excited about this podcast that the last thing I want to do is have every facet of my life and business shift into pregnancy mode now. I feel different this go around in that I just feel a little bit more like Lucy, who's running her business, who has goals, who's doing things, and I happen to be pregnant at the same time. Whereas the first time around, pregnancy just shifted everything and completely transformed everything about me. Here we are now. I am four weeks and three days pregnant. It's still very early. 
And listen, I do know that having a miscarriage between babies one and two is apparently a very common happening. It actually happened to my mom in between my brother and me and my sister. So I know it's a very common thing. And despite that, I have already told my closest friends and family about this pregnancy because my mindset on it is these are people that I would tell about my miscarriage anyway if I have one. So I want to share in the excitement that I'm feeling right now. The truth is I would actually tell the whole world about a miscarriage if I had it. So I'm still grappling with when do I want to share about this pregnancy because I know it's just the norm to post about a pregnancy after you've cleared the first trimester. And I guess my my thought behind that is you never really know anything. Nothing is guaranteed ever. You can get through 40 weeks of pregnancy and have complications. So that's just sort of where my head is at right now. I'm trying to figure out how long I want to wait before I just can kind of put out there what's going on in my life. I will be sure to pop on here next week and give you an update. So far, the only thing I've done so far is go to my new OB's office to get blood taken. Even though you don't have to do this, I did this with my first pregnancy and she said if I wanted to, I could come in and get my HCG levels tested and then wait a couple days and come back and get them tested again just to confirm that the number is rising appropriately. So I went in, I got it tested at I think four weeks exactly and my HCG was at 101 if that means anything to you and I just went back today and I got the second vial of blood taken. So we'll see what that number comes back with. For now, I'm just drifting into this first week of pregnancy, and that's really it right now. So far, no other bodily changes. My boobs don't hurt yet. I'm not really having many cramps or any other feelings, and so I'm just living my normal life with my baby who's running around upstairs. So I'll tune back in at five weeks and talk to you soon. We've all had embarrassing body odor moments, and some of the worst are when that odor isn't even coming from your armpits, but other body parts. Fortunately, Lumi's whole body deodorant is powered by mandelic acid to control odor in a new way, and it delivers this outrageous 72-hour odor control everywhere from your armpits to your feet, and yes, even your private parts. I'm talking about thigh folds, under boobs, butt cracks, you name it. In fact, it was actually patients' concerns about private part odor that originally inspired the OBGYN who invented Lumi. Fortunately, Lumi's whole body deodorant is powered by mandelic acid to control odor in a new way. I love that Lumi is more like a pre-odorant, so many other deodorants just mask smells, but the mandelic acid in Lumi stops odor before it even starts. It's pH balanced for safe use below the belt, and it's paraben free. As a special offer for Real Stuff listeners, new customers can get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with the code REALSTUFF, one word, at LumiDeodorant.com. And Lumi starter pack comes with a solid stick deodorant, a cream tube deodorant, and then two free products of your choice, plus free shipping. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit LumiDeodorant.com, and that's L-U-M-E, Lumi, and you use the code REALSTUFF. We are five weeks in, actually a little later than five weeks. We're closer to six weeks, but we're mid to late five weeks. The pregnancy nausea has begun. I really, really thought that for some reason I was going to be able to evade it this time around. I think it's because I started taking my B6 and my Unisom combination at four weeks to the day. And last time with Milo, sorry, I like literally feel like I'm going to vomit. Hold on. I started doing that because in my last pregnancy, I didn't start doing that until maybe 13 or 14 weeks. And the moment I started taking that, I saw a noticeable difference. So I almost felt this time like, let me just start it early. I couldn't tell if it was just too early to be nauseous or if the medicine was working. But here we are five and a half weeks and the meds aren't working slash the nausea is just here. And the tiredness is setting in. The nausea is a little different than the first time around. I kind of remember it being more concentrated times last time in that I would be fine throughout the day except for a couple of pockets of 15 minutes here or 30 minutes here. I'd be sitting over the toilet just feeling nauseous. This time, it's more just like low-grade nausea all the time with a lot of gagging. I haven't felt the need too many times to just go sit by the toilet, but it's just like a general feeling of unwellness. I have been drinking and chewing on a lot of ice cubes. I have my ice cubes right here and this 
lemon wedge. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see. I know that's very bad for the enamel on your teeth, but the sour and the cold is doing good things for me. I actually am going to the store soon to get some Sour Patch Watermelon. I feel like that is exactly what I need. One Sour Patch Watermelon every 10 minutes. That's my plan. Other feelings and things that are going on, my boobs are really sore. Minor twinging, cramping, I don't know, just at different times. I feel different things happening down there, but not many other physical symptoms aside from the nausea. Food cravings have been coming in hot, and it's just like last time where I'll be on social media or I'll be watching a TV show and I will see a particular food, and it's like all of a sudden I need that in the next 10 minutes or else. And this happened last night. I was watching, Michael and I are watching the show Beef, and the lead character was making ramen, and I was lying in bed 10 at night saying to Michael, I think I need to go whip up ramen. And I don't have any ingredients for it, but I need the noodles and the salt and the broth and the egg cracked in it. And so I'm having ramen for lunch today. I'm actually going to go. When I get my Sour Patch Watermelon, I will be getting a little bowl of ramen, instant ramen. Actually, the store near me has a gluten-free cup noodle type thing. So that is exactly what I want right now. Oops, that's an alarm reminding me that I have a podcast recording coming up in five minutes. I'm actually a guest on someone's podcast, so it's not for my show. But yeah, the food, next level. Last night it was chili, and actually our nanny offered to make the chili for me because Michael's parents were coming in the afternoon, so she didn't need to be with Milo, and she spent the afternoon making this huge pot of chili. That was exactly what I wanted, and eating it was like a delicacy. Every bite was unbelievable until I finished the bowl and immediately felt nauseous and disgusted by it. <laughs> Nothing to do with the recipe or how it was made. It was honestly the most delicious chili I've ever had. I just, even thinking about it now, mm. no, I'm over the chili. The other thing that happened is that I got my blood work at four weeks to the day, and then four days later, I got more blood work. And my gynecologist told me I could do this just to see how the HCG levels were rising. I think I maybe recorded the four-week one before I got back the second result. My HCG level was 101 the first time around, which is a normal number for your first time getting that tested at around four weeks. They say that every 48 hours, the number should double. So two days later, it would be 200. And then four days later, it should be around 400. They say it can be higher than that, but it being lower is often when there could be a problem with like the strength of the pregnancy. If it's higher though, it could be a sign of multiples and just like a lot of the hormone because you have twins or triplets and my hcg four days later was 958 my doctor said hey just letting you know your hcg was high it's not a concern some people say that could indicate multiples but that's highly unlikely unless you are a twin yourself and so of course <laughs> i replied i am a fraternal twin and that's just kind of where we left off so I'm waiting for my scan next week. Actually, it's going to be in two weeks. I couldn't get an appointment until I was late six weeks, almost seven weeks pregnant. So my scan is going to be a little later. We'll find out if I'm having multiples. I don't know how I feel about that potential just yet. Michael and I wanted two kids. Then again, I am a twin and love being a twin. So I just think I'm not going to talk about it until I get the scan. And I'm not thinking about it too much either. I don't want to get anxiety. I'm not thinking it's twins. I'm not thinking it can't be twins. I'm just going with the flow, making my food, eating my ramen, chewing my Sour Patch watermelon, and sucking on ice and lemons. Hey everyone, I am six weeks and six days pregnant today. I really did want to do this six week recording a little bit earlier in the week when I was closer to six weeks and not closer to seven weeks, but this was a really, really rough week and I could not get down here. I couldn't imagine sitting here with these lights on looking at a camera. Mm -mm 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 -mm. It has been really a gross, nauseating, disgusting week, if I'm being honest. Pretty, pretty awful. I don't remember how this compares to last time. I remember some of the feelings are familiar. You know, this taste in my mouth that I'm going to get to, very familiar. The nausea is familiar, but I cannot even remember the frequency of it last time. I had to go back to some posts I made to see what I said. And what it sounded like I said was that I've been sitting in front of the toilet spitting for about an hour a day and like feeling really nauseous and only threw up 
kind of a few times in the whole pregnancy. What's happening this time is that I did throw up once so far. And trigger warning, throw up. We're talking about throw up. If anyone gets nauseated, I'm going to talk about it. It was one of those times when I had to run to the toilet and all of a sudden this heat overcame my body and I had to strip off my sweatshirt and I was heaving into the toilet. It was actually, thankfully, after I hadn't eaten too much. So not a lot came out, but it was uncontrollable gag reflex throwing up like my body was trying to get something out. And that only happened one time, thankfully. But the problem this time is that I am experiencing all day nausea. And I wouldn't even call it low grade. It is as if I am riding in the back of a school bus reading a book like that type of nausea, car sickness, all day, the entire day. Oh, hold on. Well, right this very moment, I can't even believe I'm sitting here because I I have this taste in my mouth. I don't know if I would describe it as metallic. It's almost like the taste that is still in your mouth after you've eaten a certain type of cracker. I don't know what to call it, but I have this taste that is just sitting on the back of my tongue. So much so that I've actually tried tongue scraping with my stainless steel tongue scraper because I feel like it's actually something I ate that causes it, but I realize it's not. It's just the taste. The absolute only thing that helps that taste is when there's something else in my mouth that I'm tasting. So I kid you not when I say that I need to be eating food every 120 seconds if I want any shot at being not sick. By the way, this week I'm talking about of this worst week was the week the podcast launched. So if you guys remember how I was showing up, you know, I felt like I needed to show up to announce the launch, but I was so not well that day. I think this time I feel maybe a little bit I'm fighting it more, but genuinely it's this all day nausea to a point where at any minute of the day, if you brought me to the toilet, I feel like I could throw up. I feel like I could, but I am just plowing through. And so I've had very few moments of needing to go to the toilet. I don't know. I guess I just feel like in my last pregnancy, I had more time to be able to sit by the toilet. So maybe that's why I was sitting there for an hour a day. And this time I just like, I have other stuff to do. I can't sit by the toilet. (laughs) I wish I was sitting by the toilet. I almost feel like if I threw up, maybe I'd feel better. But back to the food. I need to have food in my mouth every two minutes in order to taste something else on my tongue and to not let this taste come back. I got this nausea gum. I'm showing it on YouTube if you want to watch. It's called C-Band Nausea Relief and it's a ginger gum. I got that. I've been chewing that a lot. It just kind of puts another taste in my mouth except the problem is once I find something that I like, whether it's Sour Patch Watermelon or now this ginger gum, and I overdo it, then I get kind of disgusted by that. So I am so over Sour Patch Watermelon. I really, really overdid that. I'm getting to that point with this ginger gum, which is upsetting. So I just have to keep thinking of new candies and foods that bring different tastes into my mouth. Really the most upsetting thing for me right now is that the idea of eating meals and the idea of food is just devastating to me. Because I remember being a normal human who got hungry for meals and who enjoyed eating and who savored tastes on my tongue. And now... The idea of eating food is like so hot and cold in my mind. It's like on the one hand, I know I need the food. I'm actually starving a lot of the times and I need food and I know the food is going to help me not feel nauseous. However, the actual thought of foods throws me over the edge and into a nauseous spiral. I think one week ago I was feeling cravings in kind of an exciting way. Like I think I mentioned in my last recording, I would see something on TV and then go get that food. And it was like, I saw it, I craved it, I ate it, it was satisfying. Now it's like, I know I need food. I know I need a meal. So now I got to think like, what can I eat? Which then makes my brain go through every cuisine option out there. So I'm thinking like, okay, do I want a burger? Do I want Indian food? Do I want Chinese food? Do I want Mediterranean? Do I want a meatball? And like, Every food that runs into my brain stimulates the gag reflex. I think I'm really sticking to like the bland foods right now. I'm having a lot of toast with butter and cinnamon. I'm having a lot of just waffles and plain things, a lot of plain pasta. It's upsetting because I miss the time when I would think about food and get excited for a meal and have a craving. 
and go get it and it would be satisfying. And now it's unfortunate because even when I have the craving for something, I have it and it's like, oof, that didn't hit and it's not sitting well. The food is bringing me down because I know I need to eat three meals a day. Actually, they tell you in early pregnancy with nausea to eat multiple small meals a day. So now it's like I have multiple times in a day when my stomach is hungry and I know I'm going to get nauseous if I don't eat. But the thought of what to eat sends me away. I feel in general... I'm just feeling like down right now. I also did get a prescription nausea medication from my doctor. It's called, let me tell you the exact name of it, metoclopramide. I think the brand name for it is Reglin, Reglin, whatever. My doctor gave me this prescription and I took one pill of it yesterday for the first time and all of a sudden started to feel like I was getting an aura migraine, which is bizarre because that drug is supposedly a migraine drug like it would help people with migraines so today when i took it i took half maybe i think the full 10 milligram dosage is maybe too much for my body weight so i took half and it maybe helped a little more but in short i'm just feeling low right now kind of let down and you know michael and i both are not feeling great also milo right now is recovering from covid this week just pointing out this week being my podcast launch week and probably my worst week nausea wise also happened to be a week when Milo had COVID he was out of school couldn't go in the whole week because he had to wait until he was 10 days as per his school's policy and our nanny had COVID as well nanny's out Milo's home Michael and I are tag teaming at home thank the lord my mother-in-law was able to come two days in a row and be with him the full day she has just had COVID herself so she felt like she was immune it's just been a lot I think Michael and I both might be coming down with COVID at this point. So I will keep you posted in my week seven update. Life feels really not normal. And, you know, I watch Michael and Milo every morning when I come down, which is when I feel at my worst. I watch Michael and Milo dance around the kitchen to Moana. And Milo's like, mommy, dance. And all I want to do is dance. But Also, the last thing I want to do is fucking dance. And I've had to tell Milo so many times, mommy's nauseous, mommy's sick. I'm so sorry. It just feel I feel so bad that I can't play with him. And I also am trying so hard to not use language like the baby is making mommy sick. I don't want to be implanting in his brain that this baby is taking me away from him. And one thing I actually did was I looked back at my content from my first pregnancy. And I know every pregnancy is different, but I look back at my phone to see how long I was still feeling sick for. And what I found was I was still throwing up in my first pregnancy when it was two months after I had found out I was pregnant, which means 12 weeks pregnant, I was still throwing up. My best friend had a bachelorette party when I was 15 weeks pregnant. And that was when I experienced my turning point was 15 weeks. So here I am at six weeks just thinking, oh my gosh, Am I going to be feeling this way for another month and a half to two months? It's just bleakness ahead of me is what it feels like. Michael and I are very much like ships passing in the night right now because he's been picking up a lot of the slack with Milo and I've been getting so tired so early. It finally hit where we put Milo to bed at 7.15, 7.30 and last night I went to bed at 7.35 And I slept all the way through until 7.45 in the morning. Michael has been having a lot of work he has to get back to. So after we put Milo to bed, we just sort of split off. And we don't see each other until the morning when I come down feeling like crap again. It's not the best time to be Lucy Fink right now. But I am extremely grateful what this all means. I try to remind myself of the fact that being nauseous is usually a sign of a healthy pregnancy, at least I've heard it said. And I try to remind myself, one thing I really try to say, which I don't know if it's true, but I try to think consciously about the fact that pregnancy nausea is just your body's reaction to the overwhelming amount of hormones flowing around. It's not something going wrong in your gut that your body is making you nauseous to try to expel. So when I think of it that way, I almost think, you know, there's nothing wrong. My stomach is settled. I don't have to throw up. I'm only feeling like I have to throw up because of hormones. Maybe if I sit in meditative prayer and close my eyes, I can remind my body of the fact that I'm not actually nauseous, but that it's just an illusion. 
I don't know. That's what I'm telling myself. I have a really big shoot coming up in two weeks in New York City. And I'm very nervous for this shoot because I did get them to push it to the afternoon. I knew I would not do well at a morning shoot, but it's a big full day on set shoot in New York City. It's pretty much right at the time in my pregnancy when I will be eight weeks pregnant. So a little nervous about that. I remember eight weeks last time was a big no-go zone. Ugh. I feel unwell and I will see you back here in a week. If you're a parent, you know how stressful the daylight savings days can be. It seems like for the rest of the world, things are just operating like normal, but for parents of young kids on sleep schedules, everything goes awry. This year, our spring forward is gonna be made a little bit easier because we have a hatch in our son's room. The Hatch Restore helps you build sleep habits that make your unwind routine and your wake routine simple and enjoyable. We have our son's hatch programmed on a timer, so when it's after 7 a.m., his sunrise light goes on, and he knows that after that he can call us in. If he wakes up before that light goes on, he knows to go back to sleep or at least to play quietly in his crib until the light turns on. This device has completely changed our mornings. It's helped us eliminate those super early morning wake-ups. And now that we're springing forward, I know that after just a few days of using the Hatch regularly, our son's routine will be back on track. Right now, Hatch is offering my listeners $20 off their purchase of the Hatch Restore and free shipping at hatch.co slash real stuff. Visit hatch.co slash real stuff to get $20 off and free shipping. That's hatch.co slash real stuff. Week eight, here we are. This is what my voice sounds like today. Believe it or not, this is the first time in week eight that I could even sit on the mic at all and had any semblance of a voice a couple days ago. It was completely gone. So what's been going on over here this week is a lot of sicknesses. As you maybe remember from, I think it was week six, Milo had COVID and our nanny had COVID. It went through our house. I wore a mask the whole time and never got it and was so grateful that I never got it because I was so nauseous. I couldn't imagine having a virus on top of that. Lo and behold, here we are just around the early eight week time. I did acupuncture for the first time last week for the nausea and I actually think it was helpful. The results were lovely for me. The whole rest of that day, I wasn't nauseous and I do feel like my symptoms have eased up a little bit. That said, still taking my Unisom and B6. I'm also still taking the metoclopramide. So I don't know if it's the medication or the acupuncture or the combination, but I think the acupuncture was actually helpful. Unfortunately, the day after I got acupuncture, I came down with a sore throat at, at nighttime. When I feel myself getting a sore throat, I have a feeling that I can only relate to depression that starts to set in. And that's because for me, being sick is the worst thing in the world on a normal day. But the thought of getting sick and having a sore throat and potentially even worse while I'm going through all these pregnancy symptoms sounded like a criminal nightmare. Started getting the sore throat, went to bed, gargled with salt water, thought it would maybe resolve in the morning. But I was up all night with a fever and the sore throat just got worse and worse. This translated into the next day and next night of a full fever. And I was a little nervous here because they say if you have a fever over a certain temperature in your first trimester, it's not great for the fetus. So I was constantly monitoring my temperature. I was shivering, freezing. Mind you, all this while I'm sitting in front of the toilet, vomiting from pregnancy nausea. So it was really just the worst weekend, I would say, of this whole experience, even worse than the nausea while having to manage Milo while he was sick. Like a virus sick when you're pregnant, I think should be outlawed. And absolutely, I feel like the body shouldn't allow you to get that way when you're already feeling pregnancy symptoms. Unfortunately, the body is just in such an immunocompromised position to begin with that you're way more susceptible to getting stuff like that. I came out the other side with severe head congestion. At this point, my sore throat was going away. I figured whatever virus I had just passed, but I was getting flashbacks from a sickness that I had back in October that lasted through November where I had all this head pressure and sinus pressure and I wound up going to the ENT and had to take some sort of antibiotic for a sinus infection. So I went to the ENT again 
And what do you know? It's another sinus infection. This is making me feel like that one sinus doctor that I went to back in November was probably correct, who told me that I have chronic sinusitis and that I probably will need to get sinus surgery at some point in the future. Basically, they told me that if I don't treat it and I don't fix what's going on, then almost every time I get a sickness, just like the common cold, I am at risk for a sinus infection. And if I get multiple in a year, that's not good. Speaking of this sickness and just in general, the nausea and everything that I've been experiencing this pregnancy, I find myself taking way, way more medication this time than I ever did in the first trimester during my last pregnancy. And that is scaring me a little bit. Keep in mind, all of these medications I'm taking are OB approved by my OBGYN. But I'm just, I remember last time during my first pregnancy, I didn't even drink coffee during the first trimester because I didn't want too much caffeine. And now here I am in my first trimester round two, If you're looking on YouTube, you can see I made this little pill chart. This helps me remember what time of day to take everything. Anyway, I'm going for my NIPT blood test next week, which you could do at 10 weeks. So as I mentioned, I'm almost nine weeks today. Next week and a day, I'll be 10 weeks. And I'm going for that blood work that will tell me all the chromosomes and also the baby's sex. So we're going to know that pretty soon. I do have another really fun story that I want to tell, but I feel like it's impossible for me to keep going today. So I will give you that big update and tell you that fun story in my week nine update coming next week. And hopefully my voice is a little bit better then. All right. See you then. I'm 10 weeks and six days pregnant today. And let me tell you, I am a fresh new woman. This is the first week that I feel like I'm emerging from the nausea and the fatigue fog that I've been in. I don't know if it's completely gone. I am still taking Unisomin B6 and a little bit of the metoclopramide nausea medicine. So it's not like I'm off all meds, but I am feeling a lot better. Aside from obviously the raging nausea that I had weeks ago that I don't want to forget about, I think the worst part of this pregnancy for me so far has been the sicknesses that I've been getting on top of the pregnancy. The most recent one of which was another sinus infection, unfortunately, that I ended up taking a 10-day course of antibiotics for, and on day eight of the antibiotics, just as I was feeling better from the sinus infection, it turned into a full-blown, separate cold and cough. And that's what you're hearing in my voice right now. One of the worst colds of my life, I know that pregnancy congestion is a thing, but I don't think this was related. I think this was a horrific cold, a lot of post-nasal drip, and to be honest, a lot of fear that it was going to turn into another sinus infection. I mean, could you imagine you just take Augmentin antibiotics for one infection and on day eight, you get another cold. And now I just have in my head that I'm at risk for sinus infections. I, I don't think it's in my head. I think it's what the ENTs have told me. I'm just now at risk. So there is this fear that with every little sickness could come antibiotics and a full-blown infection. But I have to say, I woke up yesterday and it was my first day of not feeling nausea. It was my first day of being able to open my refrigerator and look at the food inside and smell and not feel the need to slam it shut and run to the toilet And that's a win. A few updates I didn't share with you. Can't believe it took me so long to share this, but I am not having twins. I am in fact having one baby. If I'm being honest, I am a twin. I love being a twin. My dad always says, my parents always say, twins are a blessing. And I'm sure if I was pregnant with twins, I would get on board and be so excited for it. But I do have to say, I was hoping it was not twins because... I don't know that it's what we wanted. I think we have talked about wanting to. And I was very relieved when I found out that it was, in fact, a singleton. I had sort of gotten in my head that I was getting all these signs that it was going to be twins. It was almost like any time I would ask the universe for a sign, the number two would shoot out at me from somewhere, whether it was on a bus, on the tennis court. But yeah, I was very relieved to find out that it was one. I still don't know the sex. I did the NIPT blood draw and I did that just about five days ago now. I think it should take seven to 10 days to get the results. 
that test will tell me about all the chromosomes and also will tell me if it's a boy or girl. I don't think I'm going to share in this podcast episode the sex once I find out because I'll probably do a separate post about it once we know. Dissimilar from last time when I was confident that it was a girl and it was in fact a boy, this time I don't have a very strong intuitive feeling one way or another. I have a handful of reasons why this pregnancy feels incredibly similar to my last pregnancy. And those are the reasons that make me think it's a boy. And then I have another handful of reasons of why this pregnancy feels a little bit different. And those would lead me to think it's a girl. So the place I'm at right now is basically, if you were to tell me it's a boy or a girl, I could very quickly and easily justify why Oh, that makes sense because X, Y, Z. Other updates from a nausea perspective throughout the past couple of months, the one thing that I think has been saving me the most is chewing gum. The gum, the brand is Pure, P-U-R. I've been chewing that nonstop. I buy the big bags of all the different mint flavors, cinnamon, and I kid you not, I am chewing gum almost all day aside from moments I'm eating food or recording this podcast. When I'm not doing one of those two things, there's gum in my mouth, even to the point where when I'm eating a meal, I don't have to do this anymore, thankfully. But weeks ago, when I was eating a meal, I would literally be chewing a piece of gum, put the gum down on a paper towel to take a bite of my food, chew the food and swallow it, and then between bites, put the gum back in my mouth so that I never had a moment when there was nothing in my mouth that I was tasting. That is the moment when I would get that disgusting taste on my tongue, and it has been so helpful. And that pure gum, I have to say, does not lose its flavor. I can chew the same piece for hours, and no matter how many times I pop it in and out, when I put it in, I get the flavor again. So highly recommend that gum. It's sugar-free, aspartame-free. I feel like it's a good option. A lot of people have asked me if Milo knows what's happening in terms of us having a baby and him becoming a big brother. And here's the thing. There's no way to know exactly with a toddler if they fully grasp what you're saying, but we do really strongly believe that Milo gets it. And from the moment we told him that Milo's baby is in mommy's tummy, we felt like he understood what we were saying to the point where he actually told his teachers that there was a baby in mommy's tummy, which leads us to believe that he really gets what we said if he's passing the information along. So Michael was picking him up from school and his teacher pulled, Milo's teacher pulled Michael aside and said, Michael, don't worry, your secret's safe with us, but I just want to say congrats. Milo told us your news. And Michael's like, what did he say? And apparently he said to the teachers, mommy has a baby in her tummy. Mommy's nauseous. So I think he gets it. This kid with the nausea is so funny. He like latches on to these little things. And, you know, we told him early on that when you have a baby in your tummy, sometimes you get nauseous. I kid you not, for over a month, I come downstairs every morning. And the first thing Milo says to me is, mommy, are you nauseous? To which I usually reply, yeah, I am. Thankfully, the past two days, I've said, no, I'm not. And one day I was eating some toast. The one, oh, the one breakfast. I don't know if I mentioned this. The one breakfast that I cannot get enough of is toast with butter and cinnamon. It's like a childhood delight and it is a perfect way to start every morning. And one day at dinner, I was eating my toast with butter and cinnamon for dinner while Milo was eating a better balanced meal next to me. And he looked at my toast and he said, mommy, I want I want toast. And I said, I know Milo, but you're eating, your dinner's already ready. This is mommy's because mommy's nauseous. So that's your dinner. This is mommy's. And I could see his wheels turning. He paused for a minute and then he looked at me and he said, mommy, I'm nauseous. Can I have toast? So he's smart. He definitely knows what's going on. And he's trying to finagle his way into eating my butter and cinnamon toast every day. One thought I've been having in this pregnancy is that your second pregnancy is worse and harder than your first pregnancy. Not because, you know, a lot of people say that it's just harder because you have a toddler, so you're busy and you have to care for them all day. And yes, of course, you have so much more on your plate once you already have a child that that does contribute to the second pregnancy being harder in a lot of ways. Something that is often overlooked and not talked about enough about why the second pregnancy is more difficult than the first is because in the case where you have a partner that is stepping up and being very hands-on now with your existing child, 
you've now lost your person that was there for you during the pregnancy. So it's less about Milo making my pregnancy harder and it's more about Michael's absence making my pregnancy harder. Especially in my most nauseous time, he was doing all the morning wake-ups, mealtime. I couldn't prep or touch or prepare or look at or smell Milo's food. So he was preparing meals. And especially when I got sick, like when I was in my really, really sick virus time and I was shivering with my fever on the floor while throwing up, the fact that I didn't have my husband next to me because he had to be taking care of our our toddler during that time. That is what was hard about this pregnancy. So I think I said in a previous episode that Michael and I were like ships passing in the night. I was thinking about it. It's actually, we're more like ships passing in the day. Nighttime is not a time that we interact much because of how early I've been going to bed. I kid you not, we put Milo to bed around 7.30 and at 7.45, I am in bed myself. The latest I've gone to bed is maybe 9.30, but most of the time I'm going to bed in the eight o'clock range, which is extremely early for me. And Michael is just sometimes not even done eating dinner or dessert or finished up with his work at that time. So we are ships passing in the daytime and at night we do not even pass. So that's where I'm at with week 10. I will maybe do one more pop on towards the end of the first trimester, but I know this episode is going up pretty quickly once I clear the first trimester. So I don't have a lot of time, but I just wanted to share where we're at, let you know things are improving and I'll talk to you soon. Okay, so ready? This is a microphone. You say hi. Hi! This is for my podcast. Do you know what Mommy's podcast is? Yes. Yes. Can you tell everyone what's in Mommy's tummy? A baby. What kind of baby? A boy. He thinks it's a boy. But the truth is, we don't know yet. Can you? Here, come stand with Mommy. Hi! 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 Hi, that's so nice. Do you want to put the headphones on and listen? Yes. Ready? Now you can talk. Hi! Can you tell everyone, what's your name? Milo. How old are you? Two. Uh, What's your favorite color? Um, red. Red. What color are your eyes? Um, um, white. White, yeah, well they are a little white on the edge, but what color is in the middle? Um, green. Mommy has green. Mommy's are green. I have green too. Yours are a little bit blue, right? Why don't you sing your favorite song? Moana. Make way, make way. One time to know the very much new is all you need. That was an amazing... Oh, are we licking the microphone? Yes. That's so yucky. We were singing Moana. Make way, make way. Uh, what is timer? You want to set a timer? Mm, what is timer? The timer? Where's the timer? I don't know. Okay, I'm going to let you go, but first, kiss tax. Thank you. Love you. Bye. Here we are. I am almost 12 weeks pregnant today, meaning I am so close to the end of the first trimester. At the time that I'm recording this, it's about one week before the actual episode is going live. So by the time the episode goes live, I'll be 13 weeks. Second trimester will have begun. Praise be. I was going to come on for this last update, and I was going to tell you the exciting news that I had mentioned, I think, a couple weeks ago. I talked about how I had an exciting story to tell you. And actually, last week, in last week's recording, I actually told the story But then I found out from the people that the story is about that they didn't actually want me to share that information in this episode. So I know I'm being incredibly cryptic, but I'm not going to tell you the exciting story yet. I will tell you, I'm sure, in a future solo episode or on my social platforms. My next update is that I currently know the sex of baby number two. I'm not going to share that in today's podcast, but I will do a sex reveal post in a bit on social media. And of course, I'm going to continue the pregnancy diaries throughout the second and third trimesters. So I'm sure it will come up soon. You know, something really weird happened where I was feeling better. Around week 10, 
For some reason, I started feeling better. And you probably know from my last recording that I felt like a new woman. I had emerged. And then you know what happened? The end of that week came and I was throwing up again. Basically, the day that I was going to drive to the OBGYN's office to pick up the envelope that had the sex reveal in it, I go down to my car and I had been parking my car on the street in front of our house because we're still having our mill worker come. So he's all set up in the garage. So I parked on the street. I went down to get in my car. And as I get to the front door, I'm like, what the hell? I need to throw up again. I crouch down between my car and my house so that no neighbors could see me. And there was actually this big muddy ditch that I think the snow plow has knocked a little bit of the gravel from around in front of our house off and it like dug up a big hole. And I basically went and squatted in front of the hole and just projectile vomited for two minutes obscured between my car and my house. It was a very upsetting throw up. Basically, the way that I'm feeling every morning now is like when I wake up and I'm deciding what I want to eat, which by the way, I need to eat because if I don't eat, I feel nauseous and feel like I'm going to throw up. But unfortunately, the question of what I should eat for breakfast has become what do I want to throw up in two hours from now? So on this lovely day, it was my toast with butter and cinnamon, which was just so upsetting because that was such a good taste for me for so long and now it's semi-tainted. Anyway, I think I realized that over the past week or so, I was not around the clock taking the B6. I also wasn't taking little bits and pieces of the Unisom throughout the day. So in the past two days, I've kind of gotten back into it where now I have regular set times in the day when I'm taking the Unisom and B6 combo. Thankfully, the Unisom during the day doesn't put me into a sleepy mood. So the dosing I've been doing so far has been when I wake up first thing in the morning, it's a quarter of a Unisom and a B6 tablet. At lunchtime, it's another quarter and a B6 tablet. And then just before bed, it's half the tablet of Unisom and a B6. So that means that throughout the whole course of the day, my total intake is three 25 milligrams of vitamin B6 and one full Unisom tablet, but I'm basically just spreading it out. And that dosing has worked really well for me. It doesn't make me sleepy at all, but it does help with the nausea. And then I've also added back in the metal clopramide, just a half tablet of it. So I'm taking five milligrams every few hours or so. And I realize I'm just not done being totally sick. So I've got to stick to this. As I round out this first trimester, I am reminded just how fucking hard being pregnant is. And what's kind of wild to me is that everyone's experience of this time period is so, so different. The fact that there are people out there who go through this time period that I'm in and don't feel a drop of nausea is wild to me. And the fact that there are people who go through this time period and feel 500 times worse than I do and are in the hospital is wild. You know, everyone's got a different pregnancy symptom that was sort of their problem area. For me, it's definitely the nausea and this pregnancy. It's also the fatigue really hitting me hard. I am going to bed so, so early and I'm having a lot of difficulty waking up in the morning. I feel like when I wake up, I am under a lead blanket and could be sucked back into sleep if I didn't need to wake up to go help my husband with our child. But what's crazy is that everyone's got a different symptom that's their biggest thing. And I know for a lot of people, it's those emotions and the hormones. And that's actually one area that just in neither of my pregnancies has been a thing at all. In neither of these two pregnancies so far have I noticed any hormonal shifts, any changes in emotions. I'm not more weepy. I'm not emotional about things. I'm not crying at all. And I know a lot of people who are pregnant, it just that really hits them. The one thing I've just realized so strongly over the past two months is being pregnant and not sharing about it publicly is so difficult because you are living through this thing that is consuming your brain, yet you cannot be honest in your everyday conversations. And this time around, I'm definitely so much freer when it comes to talking about it. I think I've told almost everyone that I know in my real life that I'm expecting. I was comfortable telling so many people about this pregnancy from the beginning, whereas the first time around, I really waited 
until I cleared that first trimester. This time has felt really different in that I've been very open about it, but I still haven't posted on social media. And as a person who shares my everyday life and I'm a lifestyle creator and I'm constantly talking about what's going on, I have just felt absolutely radio silent over the past two months. And I know I haven't been silent. I've still been showing up. I've still been talking about other things. Unfortunately, just everything I'm talking about feels so insignificant to what's actually going on in my life and my brain. And I am so beyond excited to come out with this podcast and share this news with you guys. I have a lot of lifestyle content about the things that are actually going on for me at this moment in my life that I am so excited to share with you guys. And finally, once this episode comes out, it will be out in the open and we can get to that content. So please make sure you're following me on Instagram at Lucy B. Think. Also on TikTok, we're about to ramp up. And of course, follow the show on social media at The Real Stuff Pod. We've got a lot of fun stuff coming your way. I also have a YouTube video that should have gone live yesterday that's just a little bit more vlog style, sharing the actual experience of us finding out we were pregnant and just a little bit more background about what's been going on. And I couldn't be more excited to be entering phase two, second trimester. Here we come. I'll see you soon. See you next week on the podcast got a lot of fun interviews coming your way and thank you again for being here thank you so much for tuning in to the real stuff i'm lucy fink don't forget to follow the show on social media at the real stuff pod and if you're liking these episodes please head over to apple podcasts and leave us a written review it helps the show so much and if you're feeling called to come on the show visit lucyfink.com slash apply and tell us your story we'll see you next week for another intimate conversation on the real stuff